What has happened, everybody? James Hancock here. I'm back to offer my completely spoiler-free review of Season 3 of The Boys. The first three episodes are going to drop this Friday, June 3rd, and there'll be one more episode each week leading up to the eighth and final episode, but Amazon was nice enough to send all eight episodes my way. And what I can tell you without giving anything away... I think this is a strong contender for the best season so far, but mostly because episode six is so insane and so deranged and just so over the top and just so satisfying when it comes to superpowered psychos doing what they do that it helped me overlook some of my nagging complaints that I basically have had with the show ever since the beginning. And don't get me wrong, this is one of my favorite shows. I pretty much enjoy everything about it. But I do think the show does have a few acute flaws, which I'll be getting into in the latter part of my review. But for now, let me focus on the positive. The first three episodes, which will be dropping this Friday, are very solid, especially the first episode, which was written by Craig Rosenberg. But I have to give a huge high five to Jessica Chow, who wrote episode six. Once again, you're going to be hearing me make a lot of references to episode six throughout this. I wish I could discuss it, but you'll just have to be patient. But trust me, episode six is going to blow your fucking mind. But I guess what I love most about this show is how, on top of all the outrageous sex and drugs and violence and gore and exploding heads, I mean, this is a show that's filled with jokes about butt sex, herpes, giant dicks, you name it. That stuff's fun, but it's all, you enjoy it on a superficial level. What I love about The Boys is how it's one of the only superhero shows and or movies that both reflects and pokes fun at our present day moment. And obviously our present day moment is one of online conflict and basically a lot of deranged behavior in every way, shape, or form. So much so, sometimes it feels like society is coming apart at the seams, but I feel like really cool shows and movies should always reflect the era in which they are made. And I think when people look back on the last few years, The Boys will be one of the standout shows that really captured the tempestuous emotions and conflicts of the present day. And if I had to call attention to one specific aspect of this show that kind of is like the secret sauce as to why it's unique, why it's so appealing, I think it's one of the best shows out there right now for poking fun at the hypocrisies of our time, especially when it comes to media, news, politics, boy bands, talk shows, biopics, celebrity culture through social media. If there's a platform out there where people can make themselves look like hypocrites or just make themselves look ridiculous, well, this show just leans all the way in on it. And I feel like that's where the writers of the show really thrive But if there's an Achilles heel to that overall strength, there are times where the writers of the show, some of them, not all of them, will almost fall victim to or kind of exemplify the very same behavior that the best parts of the show are making fun of. And I'll get to more of those reasons why later. But there are times where the show feels like it has a small identity crisis where the writers are pulling it in different directions. But luckily, the good writers seem to win out more often than not. So while spoilers in this review might be off the table, that said, anything that's discussed in the trailer, I'm going to consider fair game. And the premise for this season is that Homelander, he's going even more psycho than usual and that it might be time for the boys to cut a few more ethical corners than usual in order to take him down. And that includes Butcher leveling the playing field by adding a few powers to his arsenal. But also the boys go in search for this secret weapon that's connected to the very strange and very secret history of one of the oldest superheroes, Soldier Boy. And there was so much to enjoy this season that I pretty much ripped through the whole thing in one sitting. I watched the first episode by itself, and then I watched two through eight the following night. But let me start with my favorite ingredients. First and foremost, it was an absolute blast watching Billy Butcher finally fighting superheroes with actual powers. If, like me, you're a fan of the original comic by Garth Ennis and Derek Robertson, you probably have shared my frustration that they've been taking their sweet-ass time getting to the moment where Billy Butcher will actually crack his knuckles, get some powers, and throw down some superheroes. So while in the original comic it only took a few months to get that point, better late than never in these scenes do not disappoint. Carl Urban is just such a badass And just something about watching him just mowing people down with heat vision when you combine his already very bad attitude with all these lethal powers, well, it's just it's just a joy to watch on screen. And while Billy Butcher's never been shy about going full scorched earth on whatever mission he might be pursuing, both he and the Homelander just go all out this season, and I would say the two of them are the, like, the main feature attraction. And so while I'm on the subject of the Homelander, I might as well say 
He's one of my favorite villains of the last decade. He just leans all the way in on his villainy this season. Of course, he doesn't perceive himself to be a villain. He's a misunderstood hero in a lot of ways, but he's so damn funny and he's so damn terrifying. When he says things like, I'm the Homelander and I really can do whatever the fuck I want, you believe him. And without going into any specifics, let's just say the particular or the specific tortures or indignities that he inflicts upon his co-workers this season I mean, you're either going to just, your jaw will hit the floor and you'll be stunned into silence or you'll just be rolling around the floor howling with laughter. Suffice to say, if you're a fan of the Homelander, do not skip this season. But moving on, another aspect of the show that I love is that you will have scenes and beats and moments that never in a million years would you see in a Marvel or DC show or movie. And let's just say... There are close-ups in this season of certain depraved situations involving drugs, sex, violence, that they kind of go above and beyond anything that has come before. And you know, when it comes to nudity, both guys and girls get their moments to shine. And sometimes these moments are designed to shock, but more often than not, they're designed just to make us laugh our asses off. Fans of The Deep are going to be particularly satisfied or delighted on this front. So if you're a fan of spin-off comics from the boys, comics like Herogasm, let's just say that this season really delivers. And whether you're a fan of the comic or whether you're a fan of the show or both, I think we can all agree that one of the things this show does best is showing just how incompetent and poorly trained and just dangerously irresponsible and reckless most superheroes are. And there's some scenes on this front that are just going to absolutely blow people's minds as they start to explore the kind of secret history of characters like Black Noir and his group Payback. And Payback was the big team before The Seven which was led by Soldier Boy. And, and while I'm on the subject of Soldier Boy, I might as well say bringing in Jensen Ackles was a masterstroke. I never saw a single episode of Supernatural. I, I think that show went for 15 years. I know it's got legions of fans, but I've been totally oblivious all this time to the qualities that he brings to the table. But goddamn, he is incredible as Soldier Boy. He's basically like a nightmare version of Captain America who never went into the ice after World War II, but he's also like way more powerful. And because most of his ideas and beliefs and attitudes were formed back like in the 1930s and 1940s, it opens up all these unique opportunities for comedy as he tries to reckon with the prevalent attitudes of 2022. But he's also just hell on wheels in combat, leading to some of the best action scenes of all three seasons of this show. But there's one area where this show really shines in comparison to its competition. If you look at some of the big franchises like Star Wars, they almost kind of get stuck in second gear where they're afraid to move forward. Where instead of moving forward, what they'll do is they constantly go back and revisit the past and they'll kind of fill in the gaps. But you know when you have a show like Obi-Wan Kenobi, there's not that much they can do with a show like that because we all know where those characters are before and after that show. And it's like, well, it's not like suddenly Darth Vader is going to die. Nothing major is going to happen that changes the status quo because they're kind of boxed in by the stories that people are already familiar with. But what's great about the boys is that they can swing the wrecking ball and change the status quo as much as they like. And I'll just say that there are some major moments throughout the season that bring sweeping changes to the status quo. So if you're afraid about spoilers, stay away from the internet before each and every single episode because the world of the boys that we know and love at the beginning of season three is quite different from the world that we see at the end of season three. And last but not least, I just want to sing the praises of the fact that this show has a very deep bench of interesting characters. There are a bunch of really interesting cameos scattered throughout the season with characters like Crimson Countess. But then you have characters like A-Train and Ashley Barrett who really help just flesh out this world. And so while it's very easy to remain preoccupied with Butcher and Homelander and these larger-than-life characters, I feel like... A huge part of the secret sauce to this show's success is the enormous cast of lovable characters or diabolical characters. And at times, some of these characters, even characters that I love, like Frenchie or Kimiko, perhaps their storylines veer too far away from the central storyline to the point where it starts to feel like filler. However, having like 15 amazing characters that the audience knows and love is never a bad problem to have. So now let's get to some of my criticisms. Now, I always try to remember that when reviewing a show or a movie, you should try to review the show that is, or the movie that is, as opposed to what you wish it would be. And I wish the show, or at least the tone and execution, were closer to Garth Ennis' original comic. But clearly, after three seasons, that's not what they're going for. So I have to just kind of let this go. 
But as I mentioned at the beginning of my review, at times this show does struggle with its tone. And I'm not trying to suggest that every show needs to kind of sustain the same tone throughout. But it is trying to be offensive and outrageous at one time, at many times. But at the other times, it kind of chickens out and becomes this moral lecture that's good for you. And that is tough to pull off because you're really going in two opposing directions. And if you want a specific example of what I'm talking about, look no further than the character of Starlight. And I guess I've been struggling for years with trying to figure out why I have hesitance to completely, totally embrace the show. And I think I finally figured it out. Starlight is a boring character, and that might be controversial to say. And I think one of the main problems is that her character is completely, totally humorless. She's very sincere. She's got that do-gooder persona. And if you love her, awesome, more power to you. I'm not going to tell you that you're wrong. But she's always stuck in the position of being the character in any given scene who corrects people's language or chastises their behavior or wags her finger in disapproval. And what she reminds me of in this show is like imagine a scenario where you're in college and you get to throw your first skinny dipping party and suddenly in the middle of it, your parents show up and shut the whole thing down. She is there in the show to almost kind of tap the brakes anytime anybody's having too much fun. And it just makes her come across like a buzzkill. And in the past, I probably would have included Huey in that conversation because he's also had that do-gooder persona in the least in the first two seasons, which made me really dislike his character. But without giving anything away, Huey does turn a corner to a degree about halfway through, which makes him more interesting because a character without flaws... It's just not a very interesting character. Characters need to be racked with flaws. Look at the Homelander. He's one of the most interesting characters on the show, and he's he's riddled with flaws. And I feel like Starlight needs some flaws because right now she's just basically there to spoil the fun of everything else that's going on in the show. And this problem of locking down the tone of the boys is not unique to the boys. There are a lot of other comic book properties out there that notoriously have a tone that is difficult to capture while it's completely different in style, a comic book like Fantastic Four is another great example where we've seen three movies do a horrible job of trying to capture the flavor of Fantastic Four. And even in the pages of the comics, there have really only been a handful of writers over the years, from Stan Lee to uh, John Byrne to Jonathan Hickman, who've really been able to kind of nail it. And so... Um, Anyway, I don't want to sound overly harsh with the writing staff of the boys where at times the tone of the boys seems to be elusive to them because not every writer out there is the equal of Garth Ennis. But the good news is the writers pull it off more often than they don't. And my only other criticism I've already alluded to, because this show has such an enormous cast at this point, there are times where it struggles to make every character's personal journey seem totally essential to the central storyline. And there will be different, I guess, depending upon which characters you like, you might find your attention wavering. But there are some pacing issues throughout all eight episodes. Nothing major, nothing that cripples the show. But I feel like at this point, the show would probably benefit from killing a few of these characters off just to help maintain focus. But that's about it when it comes to my criticisms. So overall, yeah, a very satisfying season of television. And at times, I will say, it even became riveting. I think this is one of the most deliriously entertaining superhero concepts out there right now. It's provocative. It presents us with one incendiary, potentially controversial scene after another. And I love that we have at least one superhero concept out there that is consistently trying to figure out what are what's kind of like the edge of the realm of good taste and then very deliberately and willfully stepping over that line into very strange and unusual territory because uh in the absence of the boys, the superhero genre would start to feel a lot more stale and a lot more vanilla. So high five to all the writers and cast members involved. Uh, as far as spoiler reviews go, I might be coming back on certain Fridays moving forward, but I've got a ton of travel coming up, which is going to make it difficult. But when uh, episode six drops, I might not be able to resist coming back for a spoiler review of that particular episode. But I hope everyone enjoys the show. And if you enjoyed this review, please remember to like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell. I would really appreciate it. And if you want to talk more about the boys, hunt me down on Twitter at Geekin' Out. But I can't thank you enough for watching. But more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.